All right. Hey, good morning. All right. If we ain't awake yet, hopefully now's a good time to do that. I want you to grab your Bibles. This is a good time to grab your Bibles. And I want you to open up to the book of Jonah. Jonah. We're going to take the next four weeks, and we are starting a new sermon series called I Am Jonah. That's also the title of this sermon series. If we get anything out of it, if we get anything out of this series and out of this sermon, this whole sermon is the title of this series called I Am Jonah. That is, I think, the point of what we're getting out of the book of Jonah. It's an awesome thing. So I want you to, to open up to the book of Jonah. Here's what I would say. It's interesting. A lot of people are familiar with Jonah. They know the story of Jonah. Not a lot of people have read Honestly, when I talk to people, when's the last time that you actually read through the book of Jonah? It doesn't happen a lot. So maybe right now there's still a lot of, I hear still a lot of pages turning. You don't know where it is. Uh, go to about two-thirds of your way through your Bible. Find Obadiah and Micah, and you're right in the right place. Sounds like a lot of Star Wars names. Find all those sections of the Bible that sound like Star Wars names. Obadiah, Obi-Wan Kenobi, Chewbacca, Malachi. You're in the right section of the Bible. You find yourself in Jonah. It's only four chapters. You can miss it. We begin this new series. And here's what's interesting. When people think of Jonah, I even asked my son this morning. He was sitting in my office, and I knew what he was going to say. But I said, son, you ever heard of Jonah? And he said, yes. I said, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? And 99% of the time, the answer is going to be the, the whale, the fish. And you know, even then, I think most of us, and if we were born at a certain year, and you're kind of in my, maybe even a little younger than me, you don't even think of a fish. You think of like some Veggie Tales episode. That's what you're thinking of. Jonah. I don't even know what the title is. Somebody in here knows the title of that Jonah and something episode of of veggie tales, but, but here's what I want you to think of before we even dive into this, is that Jonah's about so much more than a fish. Jonah's about more than just uh, disobedience. If we were to take a whirlwind tour of what Jonah is, yes, we can, we can laugh. A lot of people think of Jonah as this laughably ironic story that, that has ironic twists in its narrative. They think of this prophet, and they like to laugh at this prophet who heard God say, go east, and he says, I'm going to go as far west as I can go. Or, or maybe we, we like to think of this prophet who's on this boat with all of these sailors and is thrown overboard. Or maybe we think about him in the belly of that fish or the five-word sermon that he preached that brought revival in. And here's what I would say. You're right. Jonah is... A, it's a funny story. It is. It's supposed to be, honestly. It's a funny story, but let me tell you what else it is. It's a sad story. Jonah is a sad commentary on not just Jonah, but what we're going to discover this morning, we discover over the next month. It's a sad commentary on us as a people of God. God, what we're going to see in Jonah, is trying to carry out this love relationship with the world, and yet the world says, I'm going to go in completely the other direction. I don't want that relationship, God. We should laugh when we read through Jonah, when we see all these twists, but we should also cry as we let Jonah show us some things about ourselves. We don't get too far in Jonah where we begin to see prejudice. You don't get too far in Jonah where you see bias. You don't get too far in Jonah. I mean, you can get to the first three verses and you see hate, fear, confusion. And put all those words under the same banner. Here's what you begin to see in Jonah's life. Sin. Sin. Begin to see disobedience. Begin to see what it looks like to let our sin begin to place limits on God's work in our life. And so we begin to read through this. So what I want to do this morning, we're just going to kind of unpack this. Instead of having a whole sermon that's an introduction, I just want to start reading through these scriptures and begin to learn what God's word has for us as we work our way through Jonah this morning. So I want you to begin with me. Verse 1 of chapter 1. I just want to read the very first verse. We begin to learn some things about this book. We begin to learn some things about Jonah. It says this. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, verse 2, Arise 
and go to Nineveh. Let me just stop you right there. In verse 1, we learn some things that are important about this book. Right here, we already begin to learn some things. Stop right here. Most people read through Jonah and they get fixated again on just this fish and this whale or the story of him spending three days in the belly of this fish and whether people are believers or not believers in church or not church there are a whole lot of people who will get fixated on trying to figure out how that's physically possible there are all kinds of people who come to the book of Joan and the first thing I want to do by way of introduction is address what are we reading here is this fiction or is this true is this a parable or is this history And we get our first clue when we read in the very first verse. I think there's a lot of people who would say, I don't know if it's even possible. Is it possible to be alive in a fish? There weren't fish that big that day. And here's what I would say. There's a lot of people who have a hard time believing Jonah. And let me just say how it's possible in a minute. But first, let me say is, I don't understand that confusion. I don't understand the confusion of Christians who would have a hard time getting fixated on whether Jonah's real because he was swallowed by a fish and in the belly of a fish, but they believe things that are way harder for me to believe. Jonah being swallowed by the fish, let me just say this, is not even in my top 10 of hardest things to believe in the Bible. We ought not get hung up on it. I mean, the very same people who are saying, I don't know if this can be real and maybe it's a parable or it's a fiction of speak are the same people who believe that God literally spoke everything into existence. That's much harder to believe. The same people who believe that Jesus was born from a virgin. The same people believe that he had the ability to raise dead people back to life, put ears back on people after it had been cut off. That he would himself die, be resurrected, and come back to the earth. These are the same kinds of of people who, who doubt this. What I would say is take any one of those other things I've said and try to describe those to your kid. And I would tell you this, Jonah then will seem like a piece of cake, a piece of cake to describe. It ought not confuse us. You know, look at this and, and answer the question, is this a parable? Maybe there's a bunch of people who read this and say, well, maybe it's, it's a parable. Jesus used to say all kinds of fictional stories to teach real truths. And here's what I would say. I don't even believe that that's true of this. I think what we're reading when we come to Jonah is history. I don't believe it's a parable. Why? Because it's not written like a parable. When we read through Jonah, we begin to see some things. We see real dates with real names. We're going to see real historical details. It's it's written overwhelmingly like it's part of historical Genre. We see already in this first verse that Jonah is not just some random name. It's not just like uh, mysterious Bob. This is Jonah, the son of Amittai. This is not a Star Wars episode. Everything's Star Wars this morning. I don't know, man. Star Wars on my brain. It's, it's not a story from long, long ago in a galaxy far, far away. No, it is, it's giving us concrete details. Other details that are verified in Scripture. I mean, 2 Kings talks about this Godly prophet, the son of Amittai. I'll read it for you. Don't just write it down. 2 Kings 14, 23 through 25. It says, In the 15th year of Judas, King Amaziah, son of Joash. A lot of names and details here. Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, became king of Israel in Samaria and reigned 41 years. He did what was evil in the Lord's sight. He did not turn away from all the sins Jeroboam, son of Nebat, had caused Israel to commit. He restored Israel's border from uh, Le Bahamath, as far as the Sea of Arabath, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel had spoken through his servant, the prophet Jonah, son of Amittai, from Goth Hefer. You begin to look at that in just three verses. It's chalked with historical details that are verifiable. And if that's not enough, we go to the New Testament. We don't even have to stay in the Old Testament. If there was one trump card that would teach us that this is not a parable, that it's not fiction, is that Jesus didn't believe that this was a parable. There was ever one trump thing you could always say to somebody is, well, Jesus said so. I mean, what can you respond to that? Jesus said it. You look at scripture in Matthew 12, Luke 11, you see Jesus referencing this historical event that prophesied about what? His own coming. Cat out of the bag. We're going to talk about that in a minute. Jesus says it's history. We begin to learn some things about Jonah. What we're reading here occurred. What we're reading here was about a real man that God used and taught. Look at verse 2. We learn some more things. 
He looks at this real prophet, his real messenger, and says, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. What do we learn? Not only are we dealing with a real person here in this prophet, we're dealing with a real location, a real place. Nineveh was a real place. We know some things about Nineveh. We know something about the Ninevites who lived in them. And the two big things that that are just important for us to know before we get to chapter 2 and 3 and 4 is the first one is Nineveh was a big city. It was one of the great cities of the world. It was said that it had a wall around the city that was so big that you could put three chariots it side by side and race around the city just on the walls of the city. Nineveh was huge. It had big architecture, the best singers, the best culture. And usually, the second thing we would know about Nineveh, just like most of the big cities, even in our day and then, is that it was also extremely, extremely wicked. That's an understatement. If you ever just want some really gory and interesting reading, read about the Ninevites. You get a little sample of this. It's just important. Bear with me. It's just important for you to know why it is that we're about to read what we're about to read next with Jonah's response to this call. God calls Jonah, this real prophet, to go and, and to give a warning to proclaim that God is aware of their evil and their wickedness. And, and Jonah's going to be confused by this. He's going to be afraid of this. He's going to be disgusted by this. Why? Because he knows who the Ninevites are. These are the kind of people when they made war against the city would go into a city and kill every man, woman, child. They would skin them alive. Then when they had taken their skin off of them while they were still alive would bury them in the ground up to their necks, rip their tongues out, nail a stake through it so that they died in agonizing, painful death, thirsty. Then they made him listen to Taylor Swift songs all day. I mean, it was just torture. <laughs> Terrible things. <laughs> it's mean. It's funny, though. <laughs> kind of true as well. <laughs> uh, I mean, you could go on and on how they treated Jonah's people, how they would have treated his ancestors. They were brutal killers. What we see happening here in in verse 2 is God comes to Jonah with a job. He comes to Jonah, his prophet. He comes to Jonah, his godly proclaimer of his word. And he says, I have an assignment for you. And the assignment is this, that I need you to go and preach to these people directly. Let me tell you what Jonah's response here. Look at verse 3. But Jonah rose to flee. His first wasn't like, oh, sounds good. This is a man who was known for, when God said, I have a message for you to go preach, he went and preached it. When God said, I need you to say something, I need you to say it. When I need you to go to these people, he went. And yet God comes to him to these Ninevites, and, and, and Jonah says, no, I'm running as fast as I, weigh, I can from that, because he was afraid, because he was disgusted. He was disgusted at the thought of having to go and be one-on-one in person with these Ninevites. Two, he was disgusted by the fact that God would even show them any attention. It wasn't just that Jonah was like, I hate these people. It was, God, you ought to hate these people. They're evil. Shouldn't be going to them with a message. We should go to them with a sword. It's interesting. You look at this, and even the fact that he was asked to go to them directly was different. It was different than all the other gigs. It was different than maybe even all the other prophets. I mean, you look at, you would look at Isaiah, and, and God gave the prophet Isaiah the privilege of denouncing Israel's enemies, but he did that from within Israel's borders. He didn't have to go into a foreign land. He didn't have to go into enemy territory. I mean, all the other prophets got to stand in their yard, maybe looking over the fence and being like, hey, y'all better listen to God. He sees what y'all are doing. Y'all better turn this around. But at least he got to do it on the safety of his own land. God's asking Jonah to go into enemy territory. And he's like, I ain't doing it. No. Can't believe you're asking me to do this. 
And you begin to ask the question, why? Why is it? Is it just hatred? And it wasn't just hatred that made him run in the other direction. It wasn't. It wasn't just bias. It wasn't just disgust. It wasn't just disapproval. It was also the fact that he knew who God was. And you read this and you think, why wouldn't he want to go preach that message? I mean, it seems like the kind of message you would want to go preach over your enemies. Hey, God knows you're wicked. He sees what you're doing. It's kind of like the joy you get when you're a little kid and you get to tattletale on your brother or your sister. Man, it's just pure joy. Ooh, ooh, I'm going to tell mom. And you just love it. You're like, you feel like that's what he would do. You want to go to the youth over here like it is pure joy. I see y'all shaking heads over here. You would think he'd want to go tell this message. God sees you. Watch out. He doesn't want to go and he want to share this message because he knows who his God is. He knows God's track record. The very verse that we were praying in Psalm 96, he knows just what David knew, that God is steadfast in love. That he's a forgiving God. That not only would he see evil, but God has a track record of forgiving and relenting. He's a God who is abounding in steadfast love and grace. In Old Testament to New, we have this picture of God in the Old Testament like some just mean, cruel, war God. But we, we read scripture like Nehemiah the prophet, 9.17. It says they refused to obey and were not mindful of the wonders that you performed among them. But they stiffened their neck and appointed a leader to return to their slavery in Egypt. But you are a God ready. To forgive. Gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and did not forsake them. It, it sounds so familiar. Jonah knew what God was capable of doing. He knew that there would be a chance that if he went and he made them aware that God sees them and God sees their sin, that there might be a chance that God would forgive. Jonah is sitting here in his sinfulness and his hate and his selfishness and his prejudice and his bias and his hate. And he's saying, God forbid that he would forgive these people. They should be off limits. God wants to do this. We know from Old Testament to New with the whole world. That's why he gave us the mission that we talked about last week. I mean, our mission as a church today is that we would go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I've commanded you. And remember, I'm with you always to the end of the age. The reason why we have this message is because God is still the same God. He's the same God that talked to Jonah, the same one now, who would look at the nations as lost as they are. And still ready to forgive. ready to forgive terrorists that maybe we would be inclined to say, go to hell. Sinners today, God is steadfast in love, chomping at the bit, Nehemiah says, to forgive. Verse 3, it says, but Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish. We're going to come back to this. Look at what he was fleeing from. Not just the Ninevites. He wasn't fleeing from God's call. It says, but Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down. If you don't mind underlining in your Bible, this word's going to show up over and over again. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went on board to go with them to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. Let me just say something. I think there's a part of us and we come to our first point of what we take away and what is some application that we take away from Jonah. Is this just some old story that's interesting that we laugh at? Is this just an ironic narrative that we'd say, I can't believe this? Is this just a veggie tale episode? No, let me tell you what this is. It's not just Jonah's story, it's yours. This is the whole series that we're gonna preach here. It's this whole sermon Jonah's story is your story. It's my story. I'm Jonah. You're Jonah. That's the first point we get in this. 
Let me tell you what you are masters of doing and what I'm master of doing. Running as fast as I can away from God. Before Jesus, verse 3 is what we do. We're running. Running. God says in Romans 1, he's made himself clear in created things, visible things, invisible things, but man suppresses it because of their sin. Runs as fast as we can. And we look at this and we give Jonah a hard time. I can't believe Jonah. What in the world? God tells you to go do something and he runs and he rebels and he says no and he chooses to do what he wants to do instead of God. Let me tell you what, that sounds like all of our lives. And we can call it rebellion, we can call it running, but let's call it what it is. It's sin. This is verse 3. We're not even three verses in. And what do we begin to see here? Jonah's rebellion against God begins. And where does he run? Just barely? Does he just kind of get a little bit off the path? No, he goes as far as he possibly can. He goes to Tarshish, which is 1,500 miles in the other direction from Nineveh. And I think we learn some things about ourselves in this. What did we learned this morning from Jonah? The first thing is this, is, is that I think so often we would think, you know what? Well, I'm not Jonah. I'm not Jonah, Pastor Bad. Maybe there was a day where I, I was running, but I'm not anymore. Let me tell you some things we understand. That could even be our story today in Christ Jesus. What do we learn from Jonah? That yes, all of us before Jesus, we are, like Ephesians 2 says, dead people following the prince of this world, following the enemy, following our own selfish nature, by nature, what are we, children of wrath? That's who we are before Jesus. But even after Jesus, we could be God's prophet. We could be God's holy man. We could be God's mouthpiece and still find ourselves, if we're not careful, running. You look at Jonah. What do we know of Jonah? The first thing I understand about Jonah, when I look at his life and I look at ministry, it says in Scripture, 2 Kings 14, 25, says that he was upstanding in every other way. If there was a godly man, this would have been the Billy Graham of his day. And he was capable. He was capable of ignoring God's call. Ignoring God's way. You see, I, I think so often we, we judge how we're doing with God by comparing ourselves to other people. That's a mistake. We would say, well, compared to, you know, this serial killer. Yeah, I'm pretty good. You know, we judge godliness. We, we judge it not by the standard of obedience to God. We, we judge it by looking at other human beings. Well, I mean, I'm not a shot lifter. You know, I'm not a terrorist. I'm not a murderer. I'm not an abuser. I'm not, I'm not any of these kinds of things. I think we would look at it. And here we get an example with, with Jonah that he really didn't, you know, he didn't get to some level of goodness that left him off limits to the effects of sin. Look, he was rebellious. If you say no to God in any area of your life this morning, I'm preaching to you. I'm preaching to me first. You have any area of your life, maybe nine out of ten areas of your life, you are following the Lord. Is there an area of your life that you would say, God, don't touch this area? No. That's what I want you to consider this morning and for the rest of this series. Maybe nine out of ten, you're like, God, I will do whatever you want me to do, but don't ask me to go there. Don't ask me to do that. No. Let's call it what it is. It's rebellion. It's rebellious if God calls us in Matthew 28 and gives us a commission and a mission for our church. And if we are slow to fulfill that commission, it's rebellion. And if we never fulfill that commission, rebellion. This is what we ought to call it. The warning that we're going to get as we read through Jonah is that if we keep doing this unchecked, I think sometimes we find ourselves drifting and moving away from the presence of the Lord. For to reject just any one command of the Lord, no matter how tough the application of that command may be, is to reject God's will and thus reject the Lord himself. Everybody, if you haven't gotten it by now, I'm just trying to make it painfully clear, nobody's off limits to saying, I am Jonah. 
I mean, even the Jews on the Yom Kippur, you know what they do even to this day? They read through Jonah, and then they all recite together, I am Jonah. So before we make fun, before we castigate Jonah, just put yourself in the story. We do it every day. I think there are people, maybe it's your relationship, where you would say, God, you know what? I have a relationship that's not pleasing to you. And I know that, that I ought to heal this. I ought to mend this. I ought to end this possibly. But I don't want to quit it. Maybe it's an issue where God's put an issue of money on your heart. Convicted about your lifestyle. Maybe you have tons of money and you become greedy and you have poverty of spirit. Maybe there's a sin that you need to confess. Maybe you, you're sinful with your time. I'll tell you what, it doesn't matter how many things you have right going for God. Look, we pay attention to those ears where we're rebellious because they will cause us to drift from the presence of the Lord. I heard somebody say one time, you're never farther from God than when you're close to him and say no. You're never farther from God than when you're close to him and say no. You're never further from God than when you're sitting in church every Sunday morning, when you have Bibles all over your shelves, when you live in a so-called Christian country, and yet when God's begging you to do what he's calling you to do, and you say, I'm not going to do it. We begin to see our first thing about Jonah is this, and we'll never read it the same again. When you read Jonah, you read your own story, sometimes daily, and certainly who we are before Christ. Let's read and learn some more things. Look at verse 4. Now let's read verse 3 again. But, but Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish, and from the presence of the Lord, he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish, away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord hurled a great wind upon the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea. You know the problem with running from God is? Wherever you go to, uh, He's there. <laughs> it's it's kind of hard to run from God. That's what I learned in verse 4. Where is He going? Is God not in Tarshish? I mean, where is he going to go from the presence of the Lord? David already made that clear to us. God, where can I run from your presence? If I go to the depths of Hades, you're there. If I go to the mountains, the heavens, you're there. If I go up, down, left, way, where, where am I going to go? There's a mighty tempest of the sea so that the ship threatened to break up. Verse 5, then the mariners were afraid. And each cried to his own God. Such an interesting, this is such an interesting story. You've got these pagan sailors and they're scared out of their wits. And they just said, hey, what should we do? What, how, do y'all have any gods that y'all know? Just what gods? You got a God, you got a God, you got a God. Pray and let's just hope one of them picks up the phone. That's what they're doing here. Maybe one of, one of them will answer us. We'll do whatever we got to do. It's so interesting. People do not have a problem with prayer. Nobody. I've never met a person that hates prayer in the midst of crisis. So they put, I heard a pastor say, they put all their crystals and amulets and hankies that have been blessed by the television evangelists, and they just start saying, one of these, I hope they work. And it says, and they hurled the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone down into the inner part of the ship and had lain down and was fast asleep. How ironic. This is our first really ironic thing. You got these pagan sailors up there having a really theological kind of a conversation. And the prophet of God, who's been given a message from God, is downstairs sleeping. And by the word, I don't, I don't want you to miss this. God begins to give us a picture of what's happening in, in Jonah's life here. Repeatedly, let me tell you a word that's going to show up over and over again. is this word down. Jonah, the book of Jonah, is full of words like this. Down is going to be repeated here. The word sleep in the Hebrew is the word used for a deep sleep. It's not really like a dozing. It's like coma. Like 
the sleep Adam took. Jonah goes down to Joppa. He goes down to the inner part of the ship. He goes down deep into his sleep. It is the sleep of death. It is a total spiritual disaster is what's happening in his life, and he doesn't know it. Getting the picture here, it was a spiral. Jonah's life, even with this one little thing, didn't matter how many other godly things he has, he made the decision that I'm not going to allow God, I'm going to disobey God, I'm going to walk in a different direction. And all he was doing was spiraling away from God. It's like when there's a strong current at the beach. Man, I go to the beach and visit my parents every year. It's like You go out and you're, you're playing in the water and before you know it, you kind of look up and you can't, find your family anymore on the beach because they're, you know, feels like a half a mile up the sand. You have been out there playing, not paying attention, and you've just been drifting and and carried away to the point where you can't even find where stuff is anymore. This is what's happening. This is what's happening to God's prophet here. It's what happens in our life. And so it's not just Jonah. It's how it's how Relationships end up in adulterous relationships at 40 because maybe somebody's addicted to porn at 20. It's how people get eating disorders in college and it begins with jealousies that they had for other people in high school. Maybe it's how people end up with this impenetrable, rebellious heart at 50 because they were resisting God and his authority in high school. Beware of drift. Rarely does anybody say no to God and take their hands off the wheel of his word and ever drift toward him. It's always a way. Look at verse 6. So the captain came and said to him, What do you mean, you sleeper? Arise, call out to your God. Perhaps the God will give a thought to us that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may Know on whose account the evil has come upon us. So they cast lots. And the lot fell on, surprise, surprise, Jonah. I don't know how many times they did it. Maybe it was a mistake. Maybe they did it ten times and it was just Jonah. I'm like, well, this is our problem. Verse 8, then they said to him, tell us on whose account this evil has come upon us. What is your occupation? What do you do? Who are you? And where do you come from? And what is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I'm a Hebrew, and I, ironically, fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid. These men have more are in tune and more respect for God than God's prophet here. What is this that you have done? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told him. Let me tell you the second thing we learned just with that last verse. Sin is a big deal to God. It's a big deal to God. Big enough deal that he's not going to overlook it. He's not going to sweep it in the rug. God is never going to be like, you know, hey, you've got most of these things right. No, sin is disgusting to God. I don't think we see it the same way he does. We like to change the wording of it so often. We like to call it mistakes and boo-boos and white lies. It's sin. It's what put him on the cross. It's what separates us from God for all of eternity. Thank God for Jesus. It's sin that does that. It's the kind of thing that that causes storms. God causes storms and seas and, and all of this chaos because of what? Sin. It's a big deal to him, enough for him to address it. Learn something else. Go to number three. Not only is it that, that we are Jonah and we have an issue with this, it's a big deal to God. Let me tell you the third thing that we learn even just before we even get to verse 10. And this is a good warning. I think sometimes we may get those first two points and miss this third one. It's a big deal to God. And then what do we learn from these sailors? Look, our sin almost always affects others. Your sin almost never functions in a vacuum is what i'm trying to say your sin is going to affect you and usually whoever's closest to you our disobedience affects others we learn that from here i mean we never even though we might think we're doing it we really never sin in private there's got to be just 
Statistics for some of us in this room, your family and your friends are suffering because of some area of your life where you're being disobedient to God. Your sin may possibly be the culprit for being a poor father or an unfaithful friend or a disappointing husband. We learn from this. I'm just, we start off with this introduction into Jonah. What does that tell me? One, it's, it's serious. We ought, to, we ought to come to grips with it. We ought to call it what it is so that we can kill it by the power of the Holy Spirit. But let me tell you what also it ought to call If I don't do it for that reason, if I don't do it because it's putting Christ back on the cross and it's dishonoring God and it's robbing him of his glory, let me tell you another reason we ought to do it. Do it for the people that you love. You know the best thing you can do for your family is follow the Lord. We're going to have a whole SNL for men tonight called Winning at Home. It's what it's going to be talking about. How do we be the kinds of men who win at home for our kids and our marriages and our families? I mean, the greatest gift that anyone could give to someone they love, the greatest gift you could give to your wife and your kids and your husband and your coworkers and your neighbors is to have a close walk with the Lord Jesus Christ and be obedient to God. It's kind of like the airplane. You know, I remember when I was a little kid and they would come on with the airplane and, and tell you that in the event of an emergency, the oxygen masks will deploy. And I remember being a little kid not understanding this. They would tell you, adults, you know, you've got to put your mask on first. I'm thinking, what's up with that? That's messed up. Oh, kids are like second-class citizens, adults. You know, are they more important than us? But the truth is, look, there's no chance. I don't have any chance with a passed-out parent. I'm not going to be able to put that mask on. A six-year-old ain't going to be up there and know what to do and follow the rules and get it on. I'm no good with a spiritually passed out parent and father and mother and friend. If you're passed out spiritually, you'll kill others around you. We are Jonah. We struggle with this. Our sin's a big deal to God, enough to get our attention, and it almost always affects others. And it gives us one last thing that we are encouraged this morning. And it, and it may not seem like an encouragement, but let me promise you it is. God loves us enough as his children to send storms to get our attention. He won't let us. If we know him and we are his children, he tells us that in the book of Hebrews because he's a good father he won't let us stay and stew in it for long. See, another thing I struggle with, my parents were um, the kinds of parents who, uh, I know these days people don't like it, but we got spankings in the Kirby household. And, and I was the kind of kid who got lots of spankings in the Kirby household. Lots of them. We had two sisters, and when you have brothers and sisters, I think you just get into more trouble. We got into trouble. And when you're a six-year-old, a seven-year-old, an eight-year-old, you just think that's mean. I mean, even kind of sick, my parents would always say the same thing. I'm sure it's the same words you heard before. They would get a belt out and look at me and be like, I'm doing this because I love you. And let me tell you, as a six-year-old, you're like, that's sick. <laughs> what? I mean, you can't process that. You love this? You love me? So you're going to spank me with this belt? It really didn't hurt. It was more embarrassing than anything else. Let me tell you what, I'm 44 today, and I, I cannot tell you how appreciative I am to have had parents who loved me enough to discipline me. Loved me enough to not let me wander and drift. When they saw me drift and they saw me start, they said, no, 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 you coming back in here. And if I have to send a little storm into your life, Brad, you come on back. I remember my dad making me. I, I, I didn't have bad grades, but I disobeyed something in our house. And my dad would say, yeah, you're not going to play in the next basketball game and you can't go to practice. It was embarrassing. The school would have let me play, but my dad's like, yeah, but, but the rules in the Kirby household says you can't play. My dad would make sure to put boundaries in my life to make sure that I didn't drift. Thank God he loved me enough to do that. God loves us enough sometimes to send storms to get our attention. God will send storms into our life to break his people from their selfishness and their own self-reliance. I don't need you, God. I'm going to do things my way. He says, okay, let's see. See if you can handle this one. See how things go when you're running the show. You ever had a parent let you do something? Let you smoke something? Let you go do something, knowing that it ain't going to end well. 
South Louisiana, they'd let you, you know, put some chewing tobacco in there just to watch you get sick and be like, oh, that's the best lesson you can ever get. God sends storms in our life to get our attention. You know what? One of two things usually humble God's people. What I wish would humble us is our understanding of God. We ought to let our theology humble us before God, but a a lot of times we have to default to the harder route, which is sometimes our affliction will humble us. Sometimes when you're like me and you're hard-headed, God says, I'm going to have to humble you one way or the other. I wish we could take the easy route. Sometimes we become slaves to money, so God attacks it and removes it. Sometimes we're addicted for people's approval, and so God frustrates that. Sometimes we don't want to listen to anybody, so God allows us some failure. Sometimes we get so selfish on thinking about ourselves that it causes all of our relationships to struggle. And some of us are in those right now, and I think there's times where I just want to say this. Not every affliction in your life is is God disciplining you. Sometimes we suffer and it has nothing to do with disobedience. Maybe it's just that we live in a broken world and you're thinking, well, how will I know? Let me tell you something. If God is disciplining you, he'll let you know. You'll know. Jonah would have known that this wasn't just a normal kind of a storm. You know, one of the things I'm thankful for a good parent is they never disciplined me and kept it some kind of mystery. Now, why am I in trouble? Well, you have to figure it out. You just get spanked or something. God lets us know. If you're in the midst of rebellion, can we end like this? Maybe this morning you're swimming in some stormy sea of sin and disobedience. Boy, there's no time like this morning to do what Jesus preached, to repent. Turn back to God. Quit fighting. Maybe take the easy route. God will do whatever it takes to get our attention. And Jonah ended up so interesting. They threw him in the water and the storm calmed. Do you think there would be a half a second where he was like, all right, maybe I'll get back on the boat. It took... A belly of a fish to get Jonah's attention. Kind of. Just finish this chapter. I just want to read it. Let's look at verse 10 and we'll finish. Let's just read through this. Or or really verse 11 it says, And then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may quiet down for us? For the sea grew more and more tempestuous. He said to them, Pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you. For I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. Nevertheless, the men rowed hard to get back to dry land. Mm. But they could not, for the sea grew more and more tempestuous against them. You got to say a lot about these pagan sailors. I mean, they don't want Jonah to die. But now here they are in, in some rowing contest with God. He's got his finger on the front of the boat. You're rowing, but you ain't going anywhere. Verse 14, therefore they called out to the Lord, O Lord, let us not perish for this man's life and lay not on us innocent blood. For you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. Let me tell you what the story of Jonah is as we conclude this morning. The story of chapter 1 isn't so much the belly of a fish. It's, it's not so much going to be running away and, and disobedience. Here's what this story teaches us and what it shows us. Most importantly, it shows us ourselves. And it shows us not just ourselves and not just our sin and not just our disobedience. Let's end with some good news. It also shows us the overpoweringly good love of God and the unrelenting nature of his grace, even in his discipline. Because the truth is, guess what? Not only are you Jonah, can I clue you into something? You're the Ninevites too. We need him in the midst of our disobedience. Jonah felt like he could run from the presence. That word there, by the way, presence in the Hebrew, panem, means face. Yeah, I want God. I know God exists, but I think there are times where we try to run from the face of God. I just don't want to look at him. Maybe if I don't look at him, he'll, he'll leave me alone. 
Maybe this morning you're trying to run from God's face and he's saying, let me get your attention before it gets too deep. Maybe this morning you don't know him. And here's what I would say. The message of Jonah really is the message of, it's our story, but it's our story that we find in Jesus. I mean, the message of Jonah, when we cover these next three weeks, really shows you who the real Savior is. What we see in Jonah is actually giving you a picture of not Jonah. He's giving you a picture of the real Savior who would come for not just the Ninevites, but for the whole world. I mean, Matthew 12, Jesus says that he was a prophet like Jonah. He said that his death and resurrection were fulfillment of the sign given through Jonah. Jonah was cast out into the sea, and the sea became calm, and he was swallowed up by a fish and taken down to the depths of the ocean. Then three days later, he was brought back to the land of the living. Jesus was cast into the ocean of God's wrath. He was in the heart of the earth for three days like Jonah and was resurrected. Jesus did everything right that Jonah did wrong. Jonah ran from his enemies. Jesus ran toward them. Jonah was on a mission for revenge because he hated the Ninevites. Jesus was on a mission to rescue because he loved them. Jonah was all about his own selfishness. Jesus poured himself out in self-sacrifice. Jesus is the Savior for our disobedience. This morning we in this service. There's no better way. I don't know where you are, but let me tell you your story. You're Jonah. If you don't know the Lord Jesus, let me tell you what, quit running. Quit running. In a minute, you can come forward. I would love, I would love, I would beg you, let me pray with you. Let me talk to you. Let me introduce you to Jesus. I pray you would run down and pray with one of our our pastors and our counselors. Maybe this morning, you know the Lord, but you're just trying to, to hide from his face. Can you come this morning and repent? Let me tell you what, it's easy to run from God, by the way. People always say, you know, I think we're in a bad place of saying, boy, you know, there was open doors, so it must be God. Look, the enemy can open doors too. I mean, there wasn't a whole lot of ships in Jonah's day, and yet there just happened to be one that he could get on and go 1,500 miles in the wrong direction. Maybe today you got on the wrong ship. You come forward and you repent. Let me ask you to stand right where you are as we pray and and end our time together this morning. Oh, I hope you'll be back next week. Chapter 2, 3, and 4 are, oh, they're good. Read it before you come. You'll get so much more out of this. Jonah, so much more to it than some singing cucumbers and tomatoes. I promise you that. Let me pray for us so we have an opportunity to respond this morning. Father, we do thank you. We thank you for your word, even when it steps on our toes. God, I thank you for your word because it's real. We can have real conversation. God, we ain't got to come in here and just play church. God, I come to you just as your servant, as your under-shepherd of this church. God, I, I need you. Oh, I'm a master at running. God, there are days because of my selfishness, because of my sin and my frustration, where I somehow think that I could... Hide from your presence. Who am I fooling? I thank you that you love us enough to discipline us. To get our attention. I pray this morning maybe for somebody, God, they come forward and you got their attention. I pray that somebody would come to know you this morning. God, I pray that we would respond. However you're leading us this morning. I pray this Jesus in your name. Amen.